Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Winston Wong. I am the chair on, at the National Academy of Medicine on the roundtable to address uh, health equity. I wanted to welcome all of you to today's webinar on COVID-19 health equity and the Asian American Pacific Islander and Native Hawaiian communities. I apologize if I need to avert my eyes from time to time away from the screen. As I mentioned yesterday, I have short eyeballs and uh, there's a lot to cover in the introductions. Um, but anyway, I was where I certainly hope that you were able to attend part one of this particular webinar workshop, which took place on Tuesday, December 7th at the same time. If you did not, shame on you, but if you did not, you can also uh, view uh, a recorded video of the Tuesday webinar on the Roundtable's website, which uh, is on the slide. Uh, the Roundtable on the Prevention of Health Equity, uh, the Promotion of Health Equity, excuse me, has developed a series of short webinars to focus on critical issues related to COVID-19 and health equity. This webinar, as suggested by the title, focuses on the unique obstacles faced by the Asian American Pacific Islander and Native Hawaiian communities. Previous webinars hosted by the Roundtable focused on African American, Latinx uh, communities, uh, the Indian American uh, community, and uh, also Native Alaskan populations. Today's webinar is being recorded again, and the archive video will be available at the link provided at the end of the webinar for you to share and to review. I want to take the time now to acknowledge the work of the planning committee for this workshop. Uh, there's uh, several people who have worked many, many hours to put together this great panel and these two webinar sessions. Melissa Simon, Ernest Moy, Michelle Wong, and Carla Thomas all worked to put this event together. Thanks so much to all of you. They're treasured colleagues and really put out so much of their time and effort to make this webinar successful. Thanks also to Christy Park uh, for her work on the logistical details of which uh, there are many. In fact, even today, uh, we uh, scrambled to fill in a um, unexpected absence because one of our speakers fell ill and she was able to do that without missing a beat. So thank you, Christy. It's really been a heroic effort on your part. Also, um, some of you might have recalled at the beginning of yesterday's webinar, um, uh, Rose Martinez of the National Academies. Uh, she introduced us as she has been critical in terms of her leadership. And um, those of you who've been working in this webinar also know that Kat Anderson at the National Academy of Medicine, our program and project director, uh, really has been the uh, yeoman in terms of the production person to put this webinar together. So thanks to everybody. It's been a great effort. Uh, during a Tuesday's portion of the workshop, uh, we had uh, inspiring opening comments from the National Academy of Medicine's president, Dr. Victor Shao, and also a keynote address from uh, Dr. Howard Koh uh, at uh, Harvard University. Uh, and then we also had two panels of distinguished presenters who spoke on the topics of the myth of the model minority and questions regarding uh, data disaggregation. It was a three hour long webinar, covered a lot of ground, uh, and I thought we had a terrific uh, foundation. Uh, of course, all the subjects we have touched upon don't do justice to the gamut and the spectrum of how we address health equity in the Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander populations. Um, all of these presentations have provided the groundwork for today's webinar presentations. We'll continue our exploration of the impact of two converging epidemics, COVID-19 pandemic plus the epidemic of racial discrimination and violence on the health and well-being of Asian American Pacific Islander and Native Hawaiian populations, and we'll discuss the potential strategies to mitigate them. Before introducing our keynote speaker, uh, Ms. Helen Zia, I want to remind all attendees to please put 
your speaker question into the Q&A box on Zoom. We'll have some time, certainly after uh, Helen's presentation, to entertain some questions. And we'll do our best to answer as many of the questions as you put in today. Um, now it's my great pleasure to introduce Helen Zia. Um, and I think it's really important how we came to thinking that Helen would be the perfect one to set the stage for our uh, second day of this important webinar. Because Helen is, is not a physician, she's not a scientist per se, but she provides the importance uh, of, uh, provides that context of which we understand all these issues, not only from a historical perspective, but from a, a, a critical uh, uh, perspective with regards to what's going on today and the convergence of all these issues. So we thought for um, the populations that we care for, these are the critical issues that we need to put in place as we think about policy that will be effective in terms of not only mitigating the COVID-19 pandemic, but also our uh, health and the public health of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders as we think forward. Helen Z is a writer, activist, and Fulbright scholar. Her latest book, uh, last book, About Out of Shanghai, which I read, which was great, um, was an NPR best book of 2019. So we encourage all of you to look at the latest work from Helen. The daughter of immigrants from China, her activism in the 1980s landmark civil rights case of anti-Asian violence is featured in the Oscar nominated documentary, Who Killed Vincent Chin? In 2010, she was a witness in the federal marriage equality case decided before the Supreme Court. Helen is a graduate of Princeton University's first co-educational class, and she attended medical school for two years, then worked on a as a construction construction laborer, an auto worker, and a community organizer, after which she uh, discovered her life's work as a writer. So she's uniquely qualified to provide us with the context in which we confront these two pandemics. So Helen, it's my greatest pleasure to uh, provide you with uh, the podium, so to speak now, uh, to provide us with this uh, context in which we understand these issues. Helen? Thank you so much, Winston. It's really my honor to be uh, joining you today um, and to be speaking to the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. Um, Winston is a, is a dear colleague and friend of mine, somebody whose work I've admired for so long. And so um, when he invited me to, um, to speak to you all, I of course couldn't say no. And I know the uh, great work he does. So my, my hope is that something I say today will be meaningful to all of you. I, I did put together a bit of a um, PowerPoint and uh, I'm going to try to barrel through it so that there's uh, time for your uh, questions and comments. And as he noted, I, I'm not a, a scientist, engineer or doctor or in medicine, but I am a medical school dropout. So that must count for something. So, so anyway, let me just begin here. I'm going to be um, trying to give some context to where we are today. Uh, I do write about the uh, race and social justice and in particular about uh, Asian Americans. Um, I try to be inclusive in my knowledge about Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, but being uh, a Chinese American daughter of immigrants, that is where my, um, my uh, life knowledge base comes from. So I'd like to, um, I guess with that, just uh, give a caveat, I'm gonna be covering a lot of ground and talking about a lot of very, very diverse communities. And so I, I will not um, be able to give the attention that's really needed uh, to each, but there are resources available. And I would like to begin by actually referring you all to this report that I worked on in conjunction with um, the One Nation AAPI Commission um, that's part of Asian Health Services in Oakland. I have a, a, a 
a link to this that I've, I've given for resources. The whole report is online and there's a lot more data and information in there about specific communities. So let me just um, go to the first slide, please. So yes, I know this is text heavy. The whole slideshow is not text heavy, but I just wanted to begin with a context of where we are today. That uh, of course, you all know that beginning in December, 2019, um, the coronavirus was identified in China. And even though uh, it took months before it reached uh, North America, uh, Asian American communities instantly began feeling the, uh, the pressure, the harassment, the uh, prejudice and racism. And um, even today, it's a question whether uh, Asian communities like Chinatowns will actually be able to survive um, as communities in the future. And we know just from now, almost two years of data that the most targeted people have been the vulnerable communities within Asian American society, which uh, includes the elderly, children, and women. Two out of every three attacks that have been reported have been, been against women as well as girls. And all Asian and uh, Pacific Islander communities have uh, found themselves being targets, whether they're East Asian, South Asian, Southeast Asian, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander. It's that association, you know, with this idea of being um, being part of a targeted group. And so we know that there have been other spikes of violence toward many other groups. And, um, and so we have to also recognize that this is a period of, of extreme um, uh, hate, hate and violence that's going on, not only in the United States, but this is a global epidemic of, of hate and violence. And so, um, as of today, there have been more than 10,000 reports given to one website, one website, Stop AAPI Hate. And there are a lot more extensive reports on that website. But that website was created not by a governmental ent entity, but by some community activists. And as of today, there are more than 10,000 reports. So let me just jump in from there. That's our context of where we are today. Um, next slide, please. And so when we talk about Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander Americans, we know that, well, you, you had a session already talking about the model minority myth, about data disaggregation. And so, you know, when we have more than 22 million uh, uh, Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders, it's incredibly, um, you know, uh, we cannot really talk about us this community as though it is like one cultural entity. And I just have this slide up here to give some, some picture of, of visibility of the, of the uh, range of just visually. Next slide, please. And so one of the questions that if you are, um, if you are of the AANHPI um, background, what we all grow up hearing constantly is the question of, uh, um, all right, I have a question that's popped up. Is there a problem with the slides? Are people seeing the slides? Should I pause here? Well, yes. Ellen, uh, I can see the slides while this is Winston. Okay, all right. So um, I'll just continue then. You know, if, if, <laughs> The question that I've heard and so many other Asian Americans, um, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders have heard from the time that we are children is, what are you? Where are you really from? And I'm from New Jersey. And when I would say New Jersey, that was not the appropriate answer. And we know that the real question here is, where are you from? Because you cannot possibly be American. And so here is just another slide to show everybody on this slide is from Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander background. It includes, um, you know, uh, uh, gender diversity, gender diversity, um, sexual orientation diversity. There are adoptees who are uh, who are also um, Asian American and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander who may not have grown up 
in uh, uh, their those cultures. But um, next slide, please. What we also hear are comments like, let me guess what you are. And that includes things like, oh, you're from Taiwan. I love Thai food. Or you're an Indian Indian. And uh, one thing gender specific that, you know, little Asian American girls begin hearing um, is, I met a nice little girl like you when I was stationed in, and no uh, a woman wants to hear the rest of that. And um, for Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders, you know, I often refer to the National Geographic Survey of Geography that's been done periodically for high school graduates of, of uh, the US, where a vast majority of people surveyed cannot find the Pacific, Island, the Pacific Ocean on a map. And we know from when uh, President Obama was president, there's a, a, a large number of people in our um, society, including in the halls of Congress that don't even know Hawaii is a state. And so, um, so with these kind of things, we know there's a vast ignorance about our communities. And so uh, let me go on, please, to the next slide. And so this is a very out of date slide. Uh, you could actually triple all of these numbers, but it's uh, one of the slides that, uh, that I found that actually just gives a, uh, a list that is not complete. And so uh, we could, add, you know, we could double the, you know, uh, or triple the number of, of uh, you know, uh, countries of origin, lists of, of uh, ancestral cultures here. But this just gives some idea of, you know, the, um, the diversity and variety and backgrounds and cultural differences among this, um, this, you know, grouping, Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders. Next slide, please. And so there is plenty of data. I'm sure yesterday uh, in your second session, you went through some of these things about what disaggregation will reveal. But the idea of the model minority, which you discussed is, you know, one of the fundamental things about that is that um, Asian Americans are all rich. And so when you actually break it down, you can see that there is a large uh, a wealth and poverty gap. And, uh, and a recent survey that was done in New York City found that the one racial group that is, has the highest rate of poverty in New York City. Uh, I don't think any of you would guess that it's Asian Americans, but that is what they found. Next slide, please. The other piece of this um, model minority myth is that every uh, you know Asian American Pacific Islander is uh, uh, you know somebody who's gone to elite um, elite higher education, highly educated. And then when we actually break it down, we know that that's not true. My own mother did not complete the third grade. And we know from our real stories of our Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities that, um, that in fact, this idea of all being elite educated people is simply not true. Next slide, please. So what I wanted to do is if there is to, to say in this, um, background overview is that if people really fundamentally do not know that much factual information about who Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders are, what is there that they think they know? Because what is between their ears is not a, a void. It's not empty. What it is filled with is something that we all have been uh, uh, I, say, I would say conditioned to, um, to believe things that we have all consumed. And I think these, uh, this has been toxins that we have consumed. And so it's very simple. You know, the, the actual um, cartoon characters that exist within people's minds uh, who, know, who actually know very little about who um, this wide range of peoples are are uh, can be boiled down to a few 
cartoon characters, and I put here gooks, geishas, and geeks. Gooks, please, is I put in quotes because it is a slur, but that is how we are viewed. Next uh, slide, please. And so this idea of once a gook, always a gook, you know, what is that? That is the enemy invader, the evil invader and perpetual foreigner who can never be American. And so what I have here on this slide are some historical um, pictures in the first, you know, in the in these first um, uh, row, which are, you know, 150 year old, 150 year old cartoons up here. You know, they're, they weren't drawn as cartoons. This is the way before photographs, um, images that would appear in the public media. But, you know, this first one is, is a, supposed to be a Chinese worker who works so hard that he is like an octopus and has many arms, can do so many jobs, and one of his arms is holding a big bag of money. So, you know, that idea about being the rich, um, you know, model minority goes in there. They're hard workers and they are a threat because they are um, uh, cartoonish, they're not human, there are so many other cartoons and drawings you can find from this period of time that depict people of Asian descent as, as uh, rodents, animals, monkeys, but essentially not human. And, um, and you can see that there are these unemployed real Americans who are standing out uh, outside. Then we move on to the media period, motion pictures. You know, there are so many movies that we can put up here about the alien invader. This is Ming the Conqueror, Ming, who all of these, whether it's Fu Manchu or Ming the Conqueror, have these grotesque uh, uh, yellow face features because these are not real Asians portraying these um, alien invaders. And in his case, he's an uh, alien from outer space bent on destroying the universe and only the real Americans can save the world. Uh, we move on to a period of video games. And so this is a drawing from a video game. I mean, you know, we see a consistent trend here um, in terms of pictures. And then the lower row, which are modern day uh, magazine covers. And we can see the, you know, the evil eye of each of these pictures. Yes, these are photographs of real Asian individuals, but the photos have been changed to render their expressions and their eyes to be, to be well, the evil invader who's bent on destroying America. And I'll say more about that. Um, so once a gook, always a gook. And this is part of what has led us to where we are today with this pandemic of anti-Asian hate. Um, next slide, please. And then there are the geeks. You had a whole session about the model minority and the, the, the racist myth that that stems from. Um, these are just some of the, the, uh, uh, the picture on the left, some of you might recognize from the iconic movie Breakfast at Tiffany's, which had to have, for some reason, this despicable, horrible Asian character portrayed in yellow face by a famous white actor. And then another film that uh, infected an entire generation in the late, in the 1990s of what a uh, Asian American boy would be like that really led to intense bullying. And, um, but what I wanna draw your attention to and that may have been discussed yesterday is that this uh, racist model minority myth didn't just arrive from somewhere. It actually has a time and a place and a date in 1966, March actually, the Sunday New York Times magazine followed by uh, another article in the US News and World Report um, had stories written not by anybody of Asian background, but by a, by a, a uh, European American sociologist who, whose first line uh, or the very beginning of one of those stories said, at a time when Americans are awash in worry over the plight of racial minorities, the nation's Asian Americans are winning wealth and respect by their own hard work, not from a welfare check. Now, how many coded messages can you put in there? I mean, it's not terribly subtle. What was happening in 1966? It was a time 
of, of the, of the uh, civil rights movement. And so instead of uh, counterposing the um, uh, African-American civil rights leaders who are calling for racial equality, there is suddenly the emergence of this myth, this other group that is quietly winning wealth and respect and not by a welfare check. So there is a root uh, to this model minority of pitting Asian Americans against other uh, communities in the US. And so um, I'm sure you talked about that, this at length and in more depth than this, but so this is also uh, at this point in time, one of the predominant images about uh, Asian Americans in particular. Next slide, please. And so then there's the gendered version, the geishas, and who are they? Well, they, that's the female version of the gooks and the geeks. So we see in the top uh, left is um, a picture that is more than 100 years old. It is Anna Mae Wong, uh, the first real Asian to actually play in films. And she is a, uh, an evil dragon lady here, exotic, sexy, most of her roles were being, um, she had to run around half naked, but she's also evil and dangerous. And below her is, a, is a, an image of the model minority racist image gendered of an Asian woman who is of course scrubbing the back of, of, a, of a white hero. And um, uh, this image is 75 years old. But if you move to the right-hand column, we see modern day, that's Lucy Liu, you know, and what do we see? But she's basically playing the exact same um, um, uh, representation of what an Asian woman is supposed to be like, both the evil, uh, dangerous, sexy um, dragon lady, and also the submissive, Asian compliant, sexy woman who will, um, uh, rub, you know, uh, 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 her white man's back. So next slide, please. Now there's an impact of all of this, and that's what I want to really spend the rest of my time talking about. Um, we see that um, that the reports of sexual harassment and sexual assault that happens um, is if you look into studies of these, you will see that there are many, many Asian American women who uh, have filed reports of these things, because why? If you are sexy, sexually desirable, um, but also seen as compliant and passive, that makes uh, a whole group of people considered to be easy prey. And I started this slideshow with the, the data about uh, Asian American women and girls being most attacked in these uh, reports in this current period of anti-Asian violence. And then with this idea of being gooks and geeks, you know, the model minority geeks who are the ones, the high tech coolies who get called up in the middle of the night to do the kind of, you know, solve the problem, fix the software, answer the, you know, what's happening with this experiment or this research but are never considered that they could be leadership. Um, we are now in a period of time with especially these, this intensity between US-China uh, relations um, spiraling down, that this view that uh, also these high-tech coolies cannot be trusted. And so I have here two pictures, Sherry Chen, who was wrongly um, uh, uh, arrested and charged with espionage and uh, she worked for the National Oceanographic um, uh, at NOAA and Xiao, Professor Xiaoxing Shi, who is the chair of the uh, Temple University Physics Department and also arrested and accused of espionage. And we know that within the healthcare professions and research, um, I didn't have time to put more pictures together, but we know that, for example, MD Anderson uh, uh, fired three of its top cancer researchers on uh, accusations of potentially being spies. Um, one who resigned, uh, um, who was a uh, Keping Xie, uh, actually resigned because of the three arrests and, and, and firings and went to another institution and took his research with him. 
And when he did that, uh, there was a, a, a warrant where um, at 1 a.m. in the morning, the FBI showed up, took 40 terabytes of material from his home, 80 electronic devices that he had. And when we all think about what kind of research and, and uh, laptops and storage devices we have, well, for him, that ended up being 40 terabytes. They went through all 40 terabytes. And out of that, because they could not actually uh, accuse him of espionage, they took five images and accused him of, of uh, child pornography, which then had to go to trial. He was uh, uh, exonerated from that. However, um, you can imagine how much time, energy, and uh, damage to reputation that all of these kind of um, arrests and accusations have been made. And so um, there are just so many cases of this and I would urge you all to look at these because many of our institutions of higher education now have been taking stands to say that um, academic uh, research and academic freedom is being damaged by what is really uh, you know, a witch hunt that's going on to um, label many of our Chinese American and Asian American scientists, engineers, researchers as, um, as conduits to the People's Republic of China. So next slide, please. We know that hate crimes historically have against Asian Americans have risen when there is a crisis of, of an economic crisis, a downturn, a recession, a depression. And so 40 years ago, this young man, Vincent Chin, was killed by two white auto workers in Detroit. Um, that was a time, some of you may remember, when Japan was labeled as the enemy of America. Why? Because Japanese cars were being seen as, um, as the cause of why the American economy was, uh, was going south. Well, today we have a, a public health pandemic and we have an economic crisis going on. And so uh, we have another pandemic very similar to what happened to Vincent Chin, that earlier this year we saw uh, two mass killings, one in Atlanta followed two weeks later by one in Indianapolis against Asian American women in Atlanta against South Asians in Indianapolis. And so um, uh, unfortunately, this pandemic of hate, uh, in my opinion, I don't see any, any um, uh, diminishing of this in the near term. So um, next slide, please. And there are other impacts in certainly in, the, in uh, public health, we know that there are many studies about stress and uh, socioeconomic stress on communities and the impact that has on so many levels, both in, um, in people's uh, physical health, but also um, mental health impact. And I just wanted to put this slide up because, you know, when a community is viewed as the model minority, what that means is they're overlooked because it's, they're seen to be uh, as having no problems whatsoever. And I know you addressed this yesterday, yesterday on a broader scale, but on the mental health level, suicide is the leading cause of death for Asian American Pacific Islanders between the ages of 15 and 24. Those of you in higher education know that many of the unexplained deaths that happen on college campuses um, are affecting Asian American Pacific Islanders students. And so I have other data points here Asian American males um, in high school are 30% more likely to consider attempting suicide. And juxtaposing this with Asians are 60% six, less likely to have received mental health treatment. We also know that many, um, um, many in our communities come from refugee backgrounds. And so what are they fleeing? They're fleeing crises of, of, of whether they are of, of political crises at home, war, or uh, natural disasters. And we see you know, continuing groups of, of refugees coming today who are suffering terrible stress. And PTSD is something that uh, many individuals in our Asian American um, 
uh, communities have experienced. Next slide, please. And what about essential workers during this COVID uh, pandemic? We know that many essential workers are Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islanders. And I took this graph here showing, you know, frontline healthcare workers, other essential workers, um, and the yellow bar is uh, the proportion of uh, who are Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander. And under this idea of who's essential, that includes restaurant, food preparation workers, retail and sales workers, housekeeping and janitorial, police, fire workers, and firefighters, physicians, pharmacists, other necessary health care workers. Uh, I took this slide, uh, by the way, from that report that I referenced from the One Nation Commission. There are much more information and data about this. Um, and so the invisibility that comes with being the comes with the model minority racist myth um, also reveals other things that the uh, National Nurses United reported that um, in one year of the nurses who died of COVID-19, 26.4% of them were Filipino nurses, even though Filipino nurses are 4% of the registered nurses in the U.S. And so where is the attention that goes to data like this when we see that um, the essential workers in our Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander communities are doubly impacted by this uh, pandemic on so many and, and on many other levels. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to just shift here in the last few minutes of um, my presentation to another point of, of Asian Americans in um, American history and how we are what I call MIH, missing in history. And so I'm not gonna go through every one of these points here, but you know, many people think that Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, if they think of us at all in American history, and I, and I say that with an if, because for the most part, we're missing totally in American history, but if they're thought of at all, it, that story kind of begins in the late 1800s. But in fact, our history in North America, our recorded history in North America begins in the 1500s, 1500s. Why? Because of the exploration of the Pacific, there was the Spanish galleon trade, and there were Pacific migrations that included Polynesians, Chinese, and Filipinos. Why? Because they were the navigators of the Pacific. And, um, and so we can trace that to the 1500s. The Spanish archives identify in 1635, Chinese barbers who were in Mexico City. We uh, have evidence from 1765 of Filipino communities in Louisiana, um, the Continental Congress and different uh, uh, newspapers and so forth in colonial America have recorded Asian people in North America. And it's a civil war. There were actually hundreds of Asian American, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders who fought in the American Civil War. But these are the kind of things that are MIH, missing in history. Next slide, please. And so with this idea that A, Asian American, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders are invisible, you know, invisible in science, engineering, healthcare, as communities overall in history, what else is missing? Well, what's missing are the, the real contributions that Asian Americans have made, and not only that, but solidarity with other communities. Who is this individual on the left? His name is Wong Kim Ark. He is the man that everybody in America who is of immigrant descent can thank for birthright citizenship in America. Wong Kim Ark, because of the Chinese Exclusion Act, um, even though he was a native born American, American he uh, was denied return to the United States because of the Chinese Exclusion Act. And he fought that all the way to the US Supreme Court. And in 1898, the Supreme Court ruled that he could come back into America because he was born in America. 
that made birthright citizenship the law of the land. That is because of Wong Kim Ark. And I wish I could have known that when I was a child and people told me, go back where you came from, because I could have turned around and said, you should thank a Chinese American and Asian American for the fact that you aren't back wherever you came from. And so who is the gentleman on the right? That is uh, uh, Frederick Douglass, leading intellectual and, and um, American uh, uh, voice of democracy in the 1800s. And why is he here? Because Frederick Douglass said in the 1800s, all Americans, including Black Americans, should oppose the Chinese Exclusion Act. And so here is a Black leader, a, a leader of all Americans, really, who said that the Chinese Exclusion Act is wrong. And this kind of solidarity and contributions are just, they're MIH, missing in history. And so we have a, we have a, um, a, a, a running theme, a, a dialogue that goes on today that that all of our communities are separate, we're divided, but actually we have histories of solidarity. Next slide, please. And so taking it more to um, from the 1800s to the 1900s, this is of course the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, the first uh, line of one of the marches in Selma, Alabama across the Pettus Bridge. And what are they wearing in this famous photograph? The front line is they are wearing lays from Hawaii that a group from Hawaii came to Selma, Alabama, and they also brought a banner with them that says, Hawaii knows, integration works. And so um, there, I have heard many times in my work as an activist and a, and a writer that, well, you know, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, Native Hawaiians had nothing to do with the civil rights movement in America. That's simply not true. And besides this particular march, there have been many Asian Americans who have been part of the Freedom Rides and what's happened is they've gone missing in history. And so there's this uh, view that they had no role to play. Next slide, please. And so not only that, in our, in our current discussions today uh, about uh, the uh, violence against Asian Americans that's going on, we see uh, slides going viral about incidents of, of, of Black perpetrators against Asian Americans. Um, but Actually, um, we, there are studies that have shown that more than two thirds of the attacks have been uh, against Asian Americans have been by white males. Instead, we see viral videos of, of, of black people, but we also do not see reports of black leaders who have stood up to say that these attacks against uh, Asian Americans are wrong. Um, here's a picture on the left of Jesse Jackson, who is the first national leader to speak out against anti-Asian violence 40 years ago when the Vincent Chin case was going on. He's talking to uh, Lily Chin, who is a mother of Vincent Chin. And we have Stacey Abrams, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Mayor Lance Bottoms from Atlanta. All of them have stood up and, and spoken against anti-Asian violence, um, but it's gone missing in history. We don't hear about that. So next slide, please. And there have been other incidents in history to, to highlight. I mean, who are these? Well, on the left is uh, Cesar Chavez, the leader of the United Farm Workers and who led the great grape boycott. But he's standing there talking to uh, Filipino labor leader, uh, Larry Itliang, who is the leader of the Filipino farm workers at a time when Cesar Chavez was the leader of the Chicano farm workers. And it was actually Larry Itliang who initiated the idea of joining forces to become the united farm workers to, um, to lead the fight for uh, humane working conditions for uh, farm workers in America. But that goes missing in history. Uh, next slide, please. And who is this? This is Patsy Mink, the first woman of color to be elected to the US Congress. And she was a, a congresswoman who fought great um, uh, gender, uh, gender bias by a party that told her, well, you're a woman, you shouldn't run for Congress. Well, she won. And what did she do? Um, as the representative from the state of Hawaii, she fought for many things, but including gender rights. She fought for Title VII, fought for Title IX. In fact, every girl who can 
uh, play sports in you know K through 12 and in higher ed can thank Patsy Mink for fighting for gender equality. Um, but that too goes missing in history. Next slide, please. And so what about marriage equality, the fight for uh, lesbian and gay couples to be able to, to um, have the right to be married? Well, I can thank these three couples from, um, from Hawaii who filed the very first lawsuit that actually can, then came to the national attention. Uh, and among these three included Asian American, Native Hawaiian, um, Pacific Islander, uh, members of these three couples who were brave enough to stand up and so that I'm able to, to be married to my partner of, of 30 years. And so um, this too goes, this kind of intersectional uh, uh, solidarity has gone missing in history. Next slide, please. And so this is my last slide. I just wanna end with this thought that if we are going to take on the challenges of, of public health, and uh, a pandemic that we know is going to mutate and be part of our, our human existence um, going forward. And all of the kind of social dysfunctions that, that are happening today that include violence and, and, um, and groups antagonized uh, against each other. We really have to begin to reclaim, um, you know, the real history of solidarity and a real understanding of all of our communities. And that begins with decolonizing, you know, the few cartoon characters we all have about groups that are unlike ourselves and to begin to see the full humanity of all people, to know our stories, to know the full rights and dignity of all people. And so this idea of allyship, you know, I actually think we have to move from allyship thinking that all our communities are separate, but we can be allies together, to actually move to the idea that it's not allyship, it's unity. And within the word community is unity. And that that's where we must begin. We are all part of a, our communities, whether it's local or global. And, and it has to begin with the idea that we have a long history of working together and we have to do that going forward and that the arc of history does bend toward justice, but we have to help it bend. So thank you for, um, for um, listening, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you, uh, Helen, for a tremendous presentation. Um, I just reflected, I'm 65 years old, a child of immigrants, and it's only been in the last year or two that I heard of the case that Mr. Wong brought forward to the Supreme Court back in the 1800s, um, which I hopeful that perhaps he was some way related to me, given that my name is Wong and um, the first Chinese uh, in San Francisco came from a certain section in uh, province of China, perhaps uh, I would be so honored to be related to his name that has established the right of every child baby born in the United States to be a citizen of the United States. Uh, I think you struck a chord with many of our audience in terms of these different themes you brought across. Um, let me just um, bring up one and then there's a few others. With regards to um, the looking back at history and the recurrent issues of um, xenophobia, racism, foreign, uh, the, the caricature of us being perpetually foreign and a threat. Is there something, anything different now in 2021 relative to these themes and the political situation? Is there any reason to be either particularly hopeful or alternatively pessimistic? <laughs> well, I, I do think there is uh, a lot of reason for hope. Um, my slideshow did talk about the things that were, you know, continue to be barriers uh, and have historically been barriers. But what's different today? What is incredibly different today is the, uh, uh, the demographics of what America, uh, you know, who are Americans today. So we know that um, the state of California, for example, and about 10 other states in the country have already crossed that 80% 
that um, you know landmark milestone of being um, majority minority states populations, and that the United States is rapidly approaching that. And uh, you know, uh, a lot of projections say uh, you know 2040 is going to be that time. I actually think it's going to be you know well before then. Uh, but what does that mean? It means that if every racial uh, demographic is a minority, then it really behooves all of us to <laughs> cooperate with each other. And that's sort of what my, my message was uh, at the end. And for Asian Americans at, um, you know, when I was a kid growing up, we were less than 1% of the U.S. population. Uh, in the total American population now, it is something like 7%, um, uh, 7 uh, something like that. But in any case, 22 million, somebody, I saw a statistic recently, actually that's more like 24 million today. But what that means is that we have a community of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders that has a numerical presence um, in every field, in every profession in every, um, you know, saw the numbers for essential workers, but all throughout American society. There's no part of America that is untouched by Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, Native Hawaiians. And, and we have a very activated uh, community and newer generations that are speaking up and able to utilize, you know, their smartphones or, uh, all forms of media. And in, in fact, in the resource area, you know, um, there are many videos that these younger generations are producing. You know, uh, there's one that recently just came out about the model minority, it's 30 minutes, um, by a filmmaker named John Osaki. Um, you know, and I'll send a reference to that. But on uh, PBS stations uh, last year, a five part series came out called The Asian Americans. And, you know, there's, uh, so there's a lot more resources available and a larger community of voices to speak up as exemplified by this um, uh, symposium that you, you, are, uh, you are all participating in now. So the thing is to take this knowledge and then to activate and, and take it. And, um, and that's what gives me hope. I, I really think that, you know, we have the numbers and the voices today to make a difference. If we can harness that and, and join with other like-minded people who really want to see society improve and not go backwards, um, there's nothing that we can't do. So that's where my optimism is. And, and, and what it means is we all have to do our part. We had uh, a couple of questions that um, it's unusual for a webinar that's sponsored by the, by the National Academy of Sciences, but around um, the impact of popular culture and how Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders and Native Hawaiians have been portrayed, as I think you had some really evocative slides that demonstrate it. Uh, we've seen recently um, such various fear in media, such as uh, I think someone mentioned Miss Saigon, as well as the Marvel comics, you know, Shang-Chi and Crazy Rich Asians. Where do you think the current cultural narrative of Asian Americans and Native Hawaiian specific Islanders is actually leading us? Is it bringing the, is there, a, is there a healthy trajectory relative to how Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders and Native Hawaiians are portrayed? And then thusly identifying kind of the important role that we played in American history. Um, you know, the thing about media, media, especially uh, mass media and, uh, you know, what people consume on their, uh, on their cell phones and so forth, that's all about simplifying. And unfortunately, simplifying means um, people end up relying on those cartoon characters that, that I mentioned. But the other side of that is the ability to create new media. And I've just been really excited to see that uh, there are so many more filmmakers, videographers, writers, um, storytellers, podcasters, and so forth, who are, who are telling their authentic stories. 
And so any one of these groups, whether we say Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, I mean, we know that within each of, of, of even these descriptors, there is vast, um, vast and richly tech textured variety. And so for each storyteller who comes forth to tell their own truth, um, that will show that we're not all the same. We're not all the light. We're not all the whatever that cartoon character is. You know, we're not all the 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 one group that should be attacked. But actually, you know, um, when there is more media and more stories told, and what we hope that will create more empathy and understanding and uh, appreciation of the humanity that we all have. That's what will fill in the blank. I, I think there's a danger when people think that, okay, there can only be, only be one right way to tell our story. Actually, there are, you know, 22 million and more ways to tell our stories um, because everyone, everyone has a unique story and, the, you know, Nobody thinks that there should be one European narrative, you know, European American, no one white narrative to tell or one black narrative, you know, or, you know, and so, so why can the, why should we ever think that there, there is only one correct narrative for our communities? And um, so that's the thing. I, I really think we have to support, you know, the telling of all of the good, bad and the ugly, the more, the better. You know, the more we can tell about our communities, the more we show the, the, the true humanity that we have. We uh, only have a couple more minutes, but I'm going to try to um, pose a question that brings in some themes from several questions that we've had from the audience. And that has uh, to do with the um, unity that you mentioned across uh, communities of color and um, how we think about that unity and that political force. Are there specific ways that you think we need to um, advance in that dialogue that have um, the historic dialogue either has not been um, illuminated and or has been um, destructive in building relations between our communities of color as we address, address this pandemic, as well as the overall issues of structural racism? Hmm. Well, you know, we are, it is true, we are at a time of, of great divisiveness. And this racist model minority myth has on a, on a ground level, on a community level, has really had a terrible impact um, I, for example, I've been following what's been going on in Philadelphia right now where um, uh, students, high school students at the, uh, you know, sort of top high school in the city, which is very racially diverse, has, has had a history of, of uh, interracial um, violence, bullying. Uh, a lot of that has ended up targeting Asian American kids. but what really is going on? We're talking about, um, you know, we, I, I showed the slide about uh, communities and the, the, the wealth gap, the poverty gap, the poverty that exists in Asian American communities. And a lot of the tension on the ground level, the stress on the ground level are in poorer communities, places where everybody in the community is living in poverty. And so, you know, um, when you look at a community, for example, in Philadelphia, where this is going on, we have had a history of, of poor Asian Americans and poor uh, black and brown people living together. And then with this overall cultural um, uh, poison that exists there, instead of lifting up the whole community and addressing things like poverty and uh, food and housing um, insecurities and things like that, and, and public health deficits, instead of addressing those kind of things that can actually bring those communities together with the conscious, intentional purpose of bringing those communities together. Um, instead, what happens is, um, uh, you know, different communities within the same, uh, you know, impoverished area fight each other instead of getting uh, something that can lift them all up. 
And I think that's an area where we have so much work to do. And I, I know many who are on this um, uh, webinar are in the public health area. Well, you know, we, we know how stress and poverty and all of those, you know, just um, uh, human essential uh, deficits are affect our communities. Well, how can we um, not just target one racial community with one project, but actually try to have try to address what's going on in the in the overall community that actually brings many different you know racial ethnic communities together to address a common problem i think if we have more and that's not to say those projects don't exist we don't lift them up enough we don't raise them so that everybody knows hey this is how it could be done if it's being done in you know in in one place why not try that in another place this is how it works somewhere else to bring communities that have historically had tensions and then work together around a common problem, say in the health field, and then, and then actually address something that lifted everybody up. We need to take those kind of uh, projects, those experiences, and, and um, publicize them everywhere in every form of media, you know, so that people can learn from them. Uh, well, thank you, Helen. Um, it, you know, we, we're in a webinar world. Um, if we're in a real world, you know, you get a standing ovation and, and hugs from everyone. Certainly, um, we treasure your your leadership, your insight, your 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 commentary. Um, it inspires us. So, thank you so much uh, on behalf of the Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, and Medicine, and our audience. Um, and to the audience, I know you had a number of questions. Please still populate them because we do use them uh, as we look back at the recording. Uh, and also, um, please uh, remember that this webinar is recorded. So if you want to uh, look back uh, later on at Helen's presentation or share it with others, certainly uh, that'll be available to you. Thank you so much, Helen. Well, thank you. And my gratitude to all of you who are in this field and the all of the important work you're doing. Thank you so much. Now we're going to continue our webinar. Um, we are not going to take a break. Uh, certainly uh, any of you that want to stretch your legs, yeah, feel free to, but I do want to transition to our next panel uh, and introduce uh, Michelle Wong. Uh, Michelle Wong, uh, Dr. Wong is a health science specialist at the VA Greater Los Angeles Healthcare System Center for the Study of Healthcare Innovation, Implementation, and Policy, and is an inaugural VHA Veterans Health Administration Health Equity Roundtable Fellow with the Roundtable on the Promotion of Health Equity and the National Academies. Um, Dr. Wong is going to introduce and tee up our next panel. Good morning to all of you. Um, sorry about the microphone issues. Um, our next panel will look more specifically at how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected AA, NH, and PI communities. Um, we have a slight change to our speakers for this session today. Um, so we have two speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Andy Subika. Dr. Subika is a health disparities researcher and associate professor in the Department of Social Science um, Population and Public Health at the University of California, Riverside School of Medicine. His research addresses the social and structural determinants of mental, physical, and substance use disparities using community-engaged approaches. His work has been funded by the National Institutes of Mental Health, um, National Institute of Drug Abuse, National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcohol and Alcoholism, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and City of Hope, among other entities. Currently, his research seeks to design novel evidence-based interventions for underserved populations with a special focus on Asian Americans and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities. Our second speaker will be Tavai Samwelu. As the Executive Director of Empowering Pacific Islander Communities, um, also known as EPIC, Ms. Samuelo is a passionate advocate for Pacific Islanders. She was born and raised on Tongva territory. Before joining EPIC, she served as the development director for the RISE Youth Center in Richmond, California, 
and is now a member of RISE's Board of Directors. She recently joined the California 100 Commission, an organization we heard about during Tuesday's presentation. During the pandemic, she learned that her most important title is Auntie Vi. So um, with that, I will hand it off to Dr. Subika. Okay, hello, can, can everyone hear me? Or are there issues with the microphone? We can hear you. We, okay. we can hear oh, you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Kat. For, so welcome, I apologize. Uh, I am in Hawaii right now, kind of in rural Hawaii. So you might hear roosters and chickens. Um, and I guess uh, cars driving by, but let me try and share my slideshow. So I'm, I'm just gonna try and go through some slides around Asian American racism. I, some of this is, you know, we just heard about model minority myth. I'll go kind of quickly through this. Uh, I will talk a little bit about just generally Asian American racism, but then I wanna highlight, uh, I guess I was asked to highlight some of the Pacific Islander work that, you know, we've been doing recently that connects with COVID-19 and its impact. So let me try and share my screen. Okay, so I'm gonna just try and go through as fast. The really exciting part is really just answering people's questions. If they have questions, uh, let me see how this works. Okay, so uh, the past two days have really talked about this, the idea that Asian Americans specifically, and I'll start with Asian Americans, uh, there's a long legacy of U.S. discrimination. When it comes to racism, it's considered race-based discrimination that's practiced by an oppressive dominant group within racialized social systems. So racism is inherently institutionalized as opposed to um, you know, individualized or anything like that. And what is really important here is there's a dominant group. Uh, we now, you know, I use the word white supremacy more and more. Uh, over the past year, but we've long known that there has to be an action where a dominant group is wielding some type of power to suppress the status of a minority group, in this case, Asian Americans. What's tricky about Asian Americans is that Asian Americans are often targets of racism and discrimination. For instance, early Asian immigrants to the U.S., they experienced lynchings, there were mass murders of Asian communities, Asian migrants, and a lot of that is not talked about. Um, there's, you know, more recently an increase in anti-Asian vandalism, intimidation, threats, and violence that's increased even further during COVID-19. A lot of, you know, this discussion has been about that. But again, racism is about institutionalized actions and policies, and there's a long history of U.S policies to exclude and socially and economically marginalize Asian Americans. Incredibly, the Pew um, Center just released data, I don't know if this has been talked about, where Asian Americans now have the greatest disparities in income within the racial group. So wealthier Asian Americans and less wealthy Asian Americans, that is the most economically unequal racial group in the US today are Asian Americans. But historically, Asian Americans have been the first targets of racial immigration bans. We hear a lot about that now. And that was through the Page and Chinese Exclusion Acts. Uh, also, Asian Americans were specifically the targets of anti-miscegenation laws. They're banned from marrying outside their race and anti-miscegenation laws have been you know, a tool from dominant groups to wield, to basically protect the integrity of US and American society, American identity. And then there was the internment as, as someone who's Japanese American, this hits close to home of Japanese Americans into concentration camps. We don't often use the term enough of concentration camps, but that was precisely what the US government did during World War II. And then now anti-Asianism racism continues in less blatant forms, but it's still prevalent and it's still affecting mental health and a lot of outcomes. You know, everyone's familiar with the model minority myth. Oh, uh, but one issue with anti-Asian racism is that it's been deracialized. The model minority myth is such an interesting tool because in many ways it exonerates the dominant group, white Americans of their racism, because it allows people to presume that US is a meritocracy for all people of color, 
because they can highlight East Asian individuals who have been successful economically, educationally, and socially. Yet the problem is internalization of this myth actually leaves a number of Asian Americans, especially younger Asian Americans, less prepared or to have greater identity difficulties or difficulties kind of squaring that circle when they do experience casual racism and discrimination or more recently overt racism and discrimination. And the reason racism still exists and discrimination is still felt is because despite the model minority myth, Asian Americans are still fundamentally seen in this country as immigrants or others, foreigners. Uh, there is some interesting research, really nice research done by Dr. Nines Ponce, right at UCLA on Filipino Americans. Um, but then also there's been these New York Times articles that show that, for instance, Filipino Americans have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Filipino Americans, they comprise 4% of all nurses in the US, but uh, comprise 30% of all COVID-19 deaths among nurses in the US. And it's believed potentially that some of this is because many Filipino Americans live in multi-generational households. And now let me shift to NHPIs. And part, uh, a lot of my work really focuses on trying to gain information about the experiences that Pacific Islanders and Native Hawaiian adults have with mental health and substance use because there is a lack of detailed data so the research that we've conducted over time within Pacific Islander communities has found these stark rates of mental health issues. So in our studies, we found Pacific Islander adults have three times the national rate of major depression, so three times the general population rate, two times the rate of generalized anxiety disorder, and four times the national rate of alcohol use disorder. And alcohol use disorder is something that the communities themselves that I work with have often talked about as perhaps one of the main issues affecting their communities. So we've done some work on alcohol and tobacco use, specifically when we've done additional research targeting young adults. So this is 18 to 30 year olds, because this is the group communities and consistently literature have shown have the greatest uh, experiences or negative outcomes with alcohol use and alcohol related harms. Uh, we found that honestly about 50% of Pacific Islander adults that we've sampled will screen positive for alcohol use disorder on the typical screening measures that NIH uses. And we found that about 41% have severe alcohol use disorder. These are staggeringly high rates of alcohol use disorder. So alcohol use disorder is also known as alcohol addiction. And then when we did further research, we found that over half of young adults engage in what we call high risk or binge drinking every month. And that's so numerous drinks within a two hour period, which puts people at very high risk for drunk driving, fights, sexual assault, or you know, legal issues, or alcohol poisoning. When we actually asked them if people are experiencing harms, 21 to 22% reported that their alcohol use had actually harmed either their friendships or social life, health, work, finances. And then when you ask people what their levels of need are, 45% report needing mental health treatment over the past year. It's about 30% for all Pacific Islander adults, which is a very high rate. And 25% reported needing substance use treatment over the past year, uh, but 17% avoided or delayed this treatment. Uh, yeah, okay, so 35% of adults report needing treatment services, 26%. So this is not young adults. And sorry, I'm going through this. The issue is both Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, despite needing treatment, will seek mental health and substance use treatment at about half the rate, if not less, than all the other racial groups. And this is important because most racial groups will not seek treatment, is very resistant to treatment. As a clinical psychologist, that's one of the biggest issues we encounter. Yet even among this resistance, Pacific Islanders and Native uh, American, in, oh, sorry, Asian Americans are about half the rate. Uh, so what I'm gonna finish with is actually this very new data about COVID-19's impact on Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander adults. There have been increasing public health you know, data that we're seeing, but 
not as much data has looked at actually impacts of adults, especially in multiple communities. So we looked at 282 adults from Hawaii, California, Arkansas, Utah, Washington, and Oregon. So these are pretty much the main uh, states that have high levels or proportions of Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander adults and youth. And we're actually continuing to increase our data. In fact, I think we actually have about 400, uh, but we haven't analyzed all that data. In the data set, we are finding that during COVID-19, about a third report having fair or poor health. So these are more of the negative health status. And hours of sleep is something we thought was really important and we're hearing is really impacting people's health. And we found that it did decrease significantly from about seven and a half hours before COVID to 6.8 hours during COVID-19. Also, we're seeing increases in major depression, generalized anxiety disorder and alcohol use disorder among adults compared to our studies before COVID-19. And then we're seeing elevated use of just alcohol, cigarettes, and then also e-cigarettes is about 17% also. So we're seeing an increase in e-cigarette use. When we looked at COVID-19 outcomes, and this is actually just, again, going into uh, Pacific Islander communities instead of relying on public data, 32% of Pacific Islanders reported being diagnosed. Uh, so actually diagnosed, having a confirmed test with COVID-19. So we suspect the rates are much higher uh, for people who actually have COVID-19 and never got tested. 51% reported having a close family member diagnosed with COVID-19. 19% had a close family member who was hospitalized with COVID-19. And 15% had a close family member who passed away from COVID-19. So these are staggeringly high levels of uh, COVID-19 negative impacts. And when we then looked at whether people experienced distress specifically related to COVID-19, the score was about five on a 10 point scale, which is actually quite high when you think of that as a mean score. So on average, they were experiencing at least some, a moderate level of COVID-19 distress. The challenge with COVID-19 distress is when we use predictive models, we found that this distress predicted whether adults had alcohol use disorder. So every one point of COVID-19 distress they experienced was associated with 1.2 times greater likelihood of having alcohol use disorder or needing mental health treatment. Again, each point increased it by 1.1 times. During COVID-19, here's one of the positive things though, and this I think belies some of the stereotypes of Pacific Islanders not using uh, mental health care, not trusting mental health care. 65% of adults reported that they used or accepted the COVID-19, and that was as of July 2021, so that was about five months ago. And 50% used the flu vaccine over the past year. Let me see this. Okay, that's that question. Uh, the strongest predictors of COVID-19 vaccine use were older age, uh, COVID-19 distress. If they were distressed, they were more likely than to actually accept the COVID-19 vaccine. And then the strongest predictor by far was if they had received flu vaccination. And there's some really interesting public health implications for these three findings in particular. For instance, there are now talks about the idea of mixing COVID-19 and flu vaccines into one single vaccine, which actually seems like a really good way to get these you know, harder to engage communities to use the COVID-19 vaccine is you just make it a shot with the flu vaccine. Okay, so that's it. I went through it very quickly because I wanna hear Tavai talk. Okay. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, and now I will hand it off to uh, Ms. Samwalo. Thanks, Dr. Subica. I was ready to call you that. I appreciate um, what you just shared. I think I need some time with it. That was a lot. Um, and also just reflecting on, I have zero distance from the numbers that you presented and just wanting to be really clear with folks about the ways the data can't be divorced from a really human impact in daily lives. Um, so I want to share, you know, we're talking about the impact of racism on COVID-19 outcomes for the AA slash NH slash PI communities. Um, I always start with this image that I really love. It's a, an image of um, a tapa on top of an iakonga and 
this is particularly important, especially for this audience to talk about and to present. One, because these are critical forms of knowledge, production and dissemination in the Pacific community, in particular for Samoan and, and Tongan communities, because each of these tapa contain stories that are passed on and tell the stories of the families and, and the women who put their literal blood, sweat and tears into documenting um, what's true, what's true for our communities. Um, the other component of it is that these are also the heirlooms and treasures that are laid out for people to sit on when they when they participate in Talanoa. Talanoa is a talk story, Talanoa as dialogue in order to reach equilibrium and, and Talanoa also as a form of knowledge production and dissemination in our communities. So as folks who, who participate in and, and consider yourselves and proudly identify as you know, academics or researchers or or whatever titles that you bring forth. It's also for me to understand and, and put forth in this framework of Talanoa um, that I know you don't come as blank slates, that I welcome your expertise as well and your wisdom and that what I share is also the product of so many who came before me and so many of the speakers as well who, who preceded me. Um, so as Michelle said, my name is Tavai Samwalu. Um, my pronouns are she, her. And I am zooming to you all um, from what is presently known as Oakland, uh, where the original stewards, this is unceded Lishana Ohlone land. I really wanna go beyond and honor the call of so many native elders who are asking for folks to go beyond acknowledgement. Um, what does it look to actually give land back? And so for those of you who are also finding yourselves on Ohlone land, that stretches pretty far and wide uh, in Northern California, whether it's the Lishano Ohlone or the Rumatush or the Mawekma uh, in San Jose, that you are also offered this opportunity to, to give to the Segorite Land Trust, folks who have dedicated um, their lives and their purpose to returning the land um, to what's called rematriation. And, and many thanks to the wisdom and brilliance and leadership of, of Auntie Karina Gold, who has really fought for her entire life um, to return the land to, to her people. Um, so again, to go from land acknowledgement to land back, and this being an opportunity for anyone who is also on this land to participate with me. So I hope you all also visit the Segorite Land Trust. Um, because, and I really appreciate Andy offering up and being really specific about defining racism, especially because racism all the time and, and during this time in particular for our communities is, is batted around fairly frequently, um, but all, not always with a shared language or definition. So I love what Ruth Wilson Gilmore offers and provides in her seminal text, Golden Gulag, right, that Racism is specifically the state sanction or extra legal production of exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. Um, all this to say that very similarly to, to the definition that Andy offered up or Dr. Subhita offered up earlier, there's an emphasis on systems, absolutely, but where she really sits and what I think has the most gravity is premature death. And that when we're talking about what's at stake for our communities, it is premature death. I think to echo also the words of James Baldwin when tasked or challenged by folks about, well, aren't Black people dying? And, and James Baldwin's response being, they're just dying the fastest. And so what does it mean for our communities as, as Helen as Zia offered earlier to be in unity and not um, participate in things that make us complicit to each other's premature death. Um, also to say that the inquiry is placed on systems, the onus is placed on systems in order to ensure our survival. I also recognize the ways that we are talking about NHPI, NHPI and, and for the work that I do at EPIC or Empowering Pacific Islander Communities is something that often gets conflated or moved around. And so I wanna be really clear about how I'm defining, though ambitious and, and somewhat audacious in its definition, NHPI or Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander. I understand it as, you know, NH, that race is a social construct. And so 
when I talk about and when I'm speaking with you all about the social construction of NHPI as a category, I offer up this map and that this is a map of colonial impact and how often so many maps are violence against our communities because they erase not only our geographies, but our existence. And so this is a map that traces, because our work is specific to the US, um, it traces colonial impact and it also names the ways that different aspects of our community, not divided in Polynesian, Micronesian, Melanesian, but access to systems, the ability to navigate the, the proximity to death, how often is it dictated by US policy? So that we have groups of folks who are born with US citizenship in Guahan and the Marianas and, um, and Hawaii, all of these occupied lands, either US states or US territories. We have, and, and it's so unfortunate that you all aren't able to hear from Josie Howard of We Are Oceania today, because she's a brilliant and fierce leader for the Micronesian community. But we have COFA migrants, and so this is Compact of Free Association. And these compacts dictate, and they are currently under renegotiation, so we also understand that this terrain is going to shift for this community, uh, but that COFA dictates that in exchange for unfettered access to their lands by the U.S. military, the COFA citizens are able to work, live, study between the U.S. and their homelands without a timeline or a visa. Uh, what we also know is that many of the things that were promised to COFA citizens in those initial compacts that were signed in the 1980s were gutted by welfare reform. And only recently, in December 2020, through legislation introduced by Senator Maisie Hirono was Medicaid restored for COFA citizens, which is a critical point of healthcare access. We also know that there are many public benefits that remain inaccessible or inaccessible for those communities. Uh, then we have U.S. nationals for American Samoa, knowing that U.S. American Samoa is the only U.S. soil you can be born on and not be born a U.S. citizen and all the implications of that. Um, then there's this other broader category where we see there are no formal relationships with the US. Now formal relationships does not mean that they are not impacted or implicated in US empire and that they're still deeply, that we see a lot of that show up, right? That they're not still subject to the whims of America. Um, the other thing that is important to note is that in these communities without formal relationships to the U.S. is also where you see higher rates of undocumentation and how often we know that immigration status often puts you closer to premature death and, and that immigration status dictates so much of what you're able to access not only system-wise but your safety in walking around in the world. So all of this to say that when I say NHPI, when I talk about our communities, when I talk about the construction of our communities, I also know it's deeply shaped by continued colonization and militarization. So this map is a humble offering and visualization for that. Um, I'm also learning as an auditory learner how to you know, accommodate visual learners. So I hope this is helpful. Another piece, and so this is something is if we're thinking about in a national scope, so EPIC is a national organization, where on the continent our folks are located. So Hawaii, of course, has the largest NHPI population in the entire country. And what we see here is all the other places where there are growing or continuing to increase populations that will often see a, sh a shift. Um, and that the California has the largest NHPI population on the continent. Uh, we also make these distinctions in this because we recognize the unique trust relationship that Hawaii has with the U.S. government and what that means for Native Hawaiians. So quick, a couple of quick facts about NHPIs, especially if we're going to talk systems and racism and, and outcomes and uh, thinking about educational attainment some things around economics, these in particular, right, I offer them up under this framework of the social determinants of health, knowing that health does not occur in a silo, and that there are many things that are at play, as, as was noted in Dr. Subica's presentation. Um, some additional around insurance coverage and health, and why these in particular came to play during the pandemic was in thinking about one, how many people didn't seek out healthcare because they did not have coverage, 
and how that led to severely increasing case rates. The other piece of what does it mean to offer up best practices around health work for folks who have not had healthcare their entire lives? Uh, what is a best practice to someone who has not had access? The other component being, as folks talked about comorbidities, the things that put us at higher risk. What I want to offer as a shift and something that is why research is a pillar of EPIC's organizational mission is that our inquiry is placed on systems and not people. Uh, that we understand that our people and our culture are not the deficit and that everything that people are doing in order to survive and so that as people are talking about high rates of obesity, that I also challenge you to understand what it meant to take people's land and take away their food ways and their food sovereignty and also place them in food deserts, places that were largely underinvested in. I wanna acknowledge that when COVID-19 race and ethnicity data was released in April, 2020, that it was leaders like Dr. Ray Samoa, Dr. Nia Aito'oto, who some of you probably heard from on earlier this week during the conference, that there were so many Pacific Islander elders who answered the call um, and that when the flag was raised, when it was made clear that this is going to be a crisis and continues to be a crisis for our communities, um, that there was a banding together and a for like, um, an ad hoc infrastructure that was created. Um, I, I really appreciate uh, Malo Alailima, uh, who's the executive director of Utopia PDX. I appreciate the framework that they offered up of, of Samoan practices of fala velave, was that you're always preparing for an interruption and what it meant for our communities to come together for this fala velave. In many ways, stay working that they've continued for over, for almost two years now to answer the call and create systems and ways to meet each other um, when other places could not to fill in the gaps. Now, this is to show that one recent ethnicity data was first released that NHPIs had the highest case rates in LA County alone. It showed that NHPIs were 12 times more likely to contract COVID-19 than our white counterparts. Um, and so even in this, right, even armed with the data to make the case that our communities continue to be ignored and not prioritized in different spaces. Over a year later, we see that the, this map has, has only gotten more dire um, that we continue it. in California alone, I can say that NHPS continue to have the highest COVID case rates and infections. And there's always this question of why. And so I want to hearken back to the earlier slide as I was pointing out and thinking, um, sorry, not thinking, and showing and, and discussing the social determinants of health where others were, were really purporting and, and oftentimes in this very racist manner, positing our communities as inherently unhealthy. What it meant to actually talk about racism and poverty at the crux of what was killing our communities. That it's an always awful to be a poor person of color uh, and during a pandemic, it will kill you. Uh, and so these are the things that when we want to name problems, when you really wanna get at the root of what is creating precarity for our communities that we address racism and poverty. Um, and as Andy was saying, talking about the ways that dismantling white supremacy will be one of the only things to, to keep us alive and thriving as a community. So um, I wanna close out and, and then just be in more discussion and conversation um, with this proverb that I love. It's a Samoan proverb and it's really guided me and in many ways rooted me during this pandemic. It's ifofole alame ale alame. Um, this proverb is based on the belief of traditional Samoan fishermen that when you step on the spiky, thorny side of a starfish, uh, in order to heal yourself, you have to turn around, turn it over and apply the spongy side to the wound. Um, on a micro level, this is used to communicate as, as so many proverbs do. It's used to communicate that you as an individual possess all you need in order to undo your harm, in order to do your own harm. On a macro level and what has been, what I believe shaping so much of how NHPIs are showing up and showing up with and for each other, 
is that it's used to communicate that the solutions a community needs are only going to come from that community, that it's going to come from us and that we take care of us. So thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, so there was a question that came from the audience um, during the previous uh, presentation from um, Helen Zia, but I actually think that both of you could help to address this question. It's about um, the ways that the, NA, the NHPI narratives get lost when we continue to use the umbrella term API. And I know that um, both of you were very uh, careful in the use of, you know, you mentioned this is your research pertains only to uh, Asian Americans or Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander uh, individuals. And so I just wanted both of you to maybe speak to that. No, I defer to you, Tavai. <laughs> go for it. I, I want to hear this. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'll even say in the onset of this panel, as it was initially called AA slash NH slash PI, and the only named speakers were myself and Josie, that I was very adamant that it actually only be called PI because Josie and I can only speak for, for the PI community and that we have plenty of other colleagues. And so some of it is recognizing too, I, I know, and it's absolutely true, the ways that API, APIA, the, all of this alphabet soup has been a site of erasure for the NHPI community, a site of erasure that frankly, like many have been complicit in. And so even as people are celebrating representation for certain communities, they're actually celebrating oftentimes the erasure of NHPI. Um, and that even um, this like propagation uh, of media, um, so many things being filmed in Hawaii, and you can't see a single native Hawaiian on screen. Um, and what does it mean to be a site, a vacation, a destination, an escape for people with little to no protection um, for our communities? And so it's actually really painful and not only painful, but harmful uh, because as people have talked about the power of representation. And I love what, what Helen Zia mentioned about not having a single narrative and and having 22 million ways to say it. I also wanna offer up the, the principles, the fundamental principles that Pacific Islanders, and I'll say specifically from a Samoan perspective, have around stories, have around stories that I, in some, you're not even supposed to tell the stories of another village because there's an understanding that you as the storyteller impact the story. That we also understand that there's no such thing as objectivity and that most of what people have been told is objective, is actually you know just white male subjectivity. Um, and that's especially important to name in this in this space of where the sciences is most frequently the place that that narrative and that notion of or myth of objectivity is deployed. And I think the last piece I'll say, and I really appreciate the the writing of of Bell Hooks and Eating the Other, where she notes that the ceiling or shortcoming of representation is that it forces the oppressed to take on a recognizable form. And so what is it fundamentally that we are actually asking for as a community? What is it as a tool that we want this to do? How does it help us to redistribute a power? How does it, you know, as Ruth Wilson Gilmore states, like, how does it keep us from premature death to have all of this representation? And to know the distinction between representation, visibility, and power, especially because so many in our community are hyper visible and do not have political power are hyper surveilled and it has not led to significant shifts in their life like livelihood and outcomes. Yeah, that was that was really good. <laughs> okay, well, I mean if I could just add to that. So the the combination once upon a time was about right allyship, it was about building some attention for for both communities. But yeah, I mean we're way past time where we need to be way more sophisticated in separating these two groups out, highlighting them. Uh, even for Asian Americans, that term is just, it's not particularly useful anymore uh, because you talk about erasure, there's the erasure of Southeast Asians, you know, South Asian gets very little attention. A lot of my 
you know, current thinking is around this idea where a lot of really smart people like Dr. Kiave Kaholokula and right, is this idea that maybe even Filipinos, which are now the third largest Asian American population in the US, are they even Asian Americans? I mean, like, do they belong in that group? They're the only Asian group to have been colonized by the US, right? And they're also literally kind of in the Pacific Ocean. So they're technically, I think, considered Southeast Asian. But in Hawaii, we don't consider Filipino people Asian. In fact, Dr. Koholo Kula combines them with Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders to call them indigenous peoples of the Pacific. So there are kind of a new way, you know, I'm not saying one is right or wrong, but we definitely need to start being more sophisticated. We have the ability now to collect data to answer all these things. And, and then I'm, I guess I was kind of shying away from this in my talk, but Tavai was really great about it. Racism. The idea of racism, there's a lot of definitions of racism, but one of the things that I consistently find and I agree with is that it's motivated by an ideal, ideology of inferiority, right? It's where this dominant group is casting other groups as inferior uh, into these social groups that they construct called race, right? So it's all about perceptions of inferiority and this ideology, this white supremacy that is really reinforcing all of the problems that we're seeing that Tavai was talking about. And I'll include concepts like cultural trauma, historical trauma, and, and how we haven't really talked about that, but are truly the, maybe even the root causes, but then also the downstream drivers of all the health issues, including COVID-19 disparities that we're seeing today. Yeah, and a lot of it is, if I have to just keep emphasizing, it's a dominant group. It's, it's not like it's just happening. There's intentional actions that are, that are occurring consistently to suppress Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, and Asian Americans in this uh, society. Um, well, to kind of go along with that, what are um, you know, policy actions or research priorities that can really um, you know, help to fight racism um, that these communities have experienced and what can we what what can we do you know what can policymakers do what can citizens do what can researchers do to help to push back against this you want to go to buy oh so i'll give more the um academic answer and then Tobias will give the the better answer here so there's there's kind of a lot and for researchers it's helping disaggregate data that the communities can actually use uh, because data drives advocacy, data drives funding. If you can highlight a problem, you can actually then argue to get money for it, right? Like COVID-19 and one of the questions there. But I fundamentally believe a lot of this is two things. It's we need to start restoring cultural identity, cultural pride, especially for Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, I think because you know, some of my work really focused on the idea that a lot of these health disparities are because the culture has been destroyed or stolen. And there's something innate about having your actual culture, not, not your health, not your personhood, but, but your actual cultural fabric, your identity disrupted or demeaned in some way. And so building that. The other thing is grassroots organizing is super key for restoring economic social resources. And then I just, the last thing, this is a little bit more radical, but it's kind of what Tavai mentioned too, is so much of the work that we do, the interventions that public health professionals do, it puts the onus on the oppressed to um, basically, you know, fix the, the problems that have been caused by an oppressive group, the dominant group. And it's really not until we can combat that and remove the power of the dominant group to just keep on, there's terms called flexible mechanisms, multiple placement mechanisms, keep on damaging and suppressing the, the you know, minority groups like Asian Americans, the, that that's really the ultimate cause. I mean, the ultimate thing we have to do. And I guess I would want to shift the conversation to how do we do that sometimes instead of, you know, working with the communities and putting on them to kind of get money to help themselves. Yeah, it's just not fair. Right? I like that answer, I don't know. <laughs> um, I think 
So I, I accept the limitations of policy, right? And a lot of ways policy ends up being harm reduction because it feels a little bit late. And I also think about the three streams of policy of problem solution and political will. And that the, the brilliance of our communities also in that they are the most equipped and the experts on naming the problem. They are the best at really measuring the efficacy of the solution in real time. Um, and the other piece of how, how they actually create that political will, how they put pressure on policymakers. And the reality is there's actually a lot of policymakers who should step aside because they're too far away from the problem. And so what does it mean to have that self-awareness and self-reflection to understand that like you are actually the least equipped, which is you know, an act of humility and probably a foreign concept for many. Um, I also know that so many policies get made in rooms far away from the community and the community is constantly, and this is the work that we do at Epic and our advocacy of is constantly feeling it and not knowing like, oh, these are all of the powers that went into play that made these decisions. And so even empowering our communities and saying like, the situations that you are in are not your fault. They are by design. We live in systems that are inequitable and are designed in some ways, especially for indigenous communities to kill you. That's the reality, right? Because this community or because this country was built on genocide. Um, so all of that to say that like, I, to a point, right? To a point, I recommend, I ask our people, I ask them to, to engage in systems that were not designed for them with both this insider outsider strategy and how are policymakers prepared to do that as well, knowing that they are insiders uh, and that they actually have to embrace the full host of holistic solutions. The other aspect is, and when we're talking with community, many of the solutions of, of actually translating of like, oh, that's actually not a legislative solution, right? That's, that's not a legislative solution, so let's figure it out. And the immediacy of these things, knowing that policy is also often very slow. Um, and so is there something where it can feel like a frenetic pace because there's all of these deadlines, but it's very slow in meeting the needs of our communities. It's why there's this notion or myth of being self-sufficient. It's like, we're not self-sufficient. We just could not wait for you to catch up to our needs. And so wanting everybody to understand that that's what's at stake. Thank you for that. Um, related to that, there's a question from the audience. Um, about allocation of resources or reallocation of resources um, specifically to stop um, the spread of COVID-19. And I guess I would also say the detrimental effects of COVID-19, the disproportional detrimental effects of COVID-19 um, for NH and PI peoples, at least in the short term. They, this, this, you know, this question is, what would this look like to you? I guess this is the, um, the best case scenario, if you could articulate what that would be like. And a reallocation is a generous term because it assumes that they were allocated in the first place. Uh, resources often miss our communities because people don't understand how we function or how we work. They also assume an infrastructure that hasn't existed. And so even when people are allocating resources, they miss us because those resources are inaccessible. Um, so I think there's a decision and need to that because the impacts of COVID-19 were an inevitability of long-standing underinvestment, uh, that there needs to be long-standing investment now. That the reality is that people could fund the community fully for the next five years and it still wouldn't reach parity. It still wouldn't reach the number of resources. I also want to offer up this notion too of Oftentimes, white supremacy still sets the ceiling of what's needed, of what's demanded of us, and that's actually not helpful. Um, that usually people think of equity, of proportionality, of, okay, you are 1% of the community, so we will give you 1% of the resources. That's not what we need. We, we actually have, we need 40% of the resources to even get to parity. And so thinking about allocation in that way. I'm also entrusting people to do what they need to do trusting that we are actually the best suited to measure what is successful, what's not successful, and also having the space to experiment. Uh, it's, it's fascinating that people want uh, 
to fund innovation, but use old old tools to measure innovation. You want innovation, but you want a, a 10 year track record. Well, what's new about something that's been going on for 10 years? Uh, and then also wanting sustained funding for all of these ad hoc infrastructures that have been created to respond to something that although much of the world has decided that they wanna move on from the pandemic, that we're still very much in it. And the NHPI community will be responding to COVID-19 for the next two to three generations. And so the resources need to be there for the next two to three generations. Wow, that's, that's actually really good. I, I would piggyback on that and say the thing that I've noticed where the resources are most beneficial are, and not just COVID-19 consistently, is less chasing a crisis, like Tavai was saying, and more infrastructure building and building coalitions. And that's the thing I've been most impressed by with what's happened during the pandemic through Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander communities, Asian American communities, is you see these task forces creating, kind of bringing everyone to a table for the first time. And there's actually funding to build something. And that's not something I'd seen for the past 10, 15 years for these communities. And so as much as it's great to put money for testing or vaccination, building these networks, funding these coalitions, I've seen new uh, organizations just pop up, community-based organizations for the first time, be able to hire staff. So I think that's where the resources need to go because it's not necessarily this pandemic, like the virus, the next pandemic, obesity, diabetes, right we need to just be funding the building of an infrastructure rather than just responding to a crisis and i guess kind of going along with that um what are actions that um we can do right now to prepare for the next pandemic or the next um you know global disaster or you know the next health disaster what can we do right now to prepare for that because as you mentioned a lot of things were kind of reactionary once COVID-19 happened then all of these actions were set in place and resources were um, not allocated to the level that they needed to be but um, people started thinking about this what can we do to prevent the next um, the next disaster okay well I'll, I'll just say really quickly I mean, there's all the things that you think of. We need to start figuring out better ways to do health education and outreach to communities. We have to find ways to rebuild trust with both Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander communities with healthcare systems, with so, so they'll actually use services, right, when they're sick. And then the other thing though is, and I say this all the time, Tavai and I, I think are very locked in on this, is we need to be training and building a cohort of Asian Americans to serve the Asian American community, to connect with them and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders. We need to be seeing more Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, researchers, psychologists, lawyers. I mean, everyone who's needed during these crises to actually put resources and connect and, and meet the needs of these communities. And that can't happen with someone like me, you know, an academic outside. We need to be building, right, training these, people from the community and and we're not doing a good job. We just really, we really aren't even for black indigenous communities too. Yeah, we've really failed in that so far. I'm laughing, no, Andy, you're not allowed to go anywhere. Like you have to do like, um, no, I laugh because I'm constantly trying to get out of the way. Um, the first thought that came to mind is like fund public health. Uh, this is obvious very clearly. And I think funding public health is is, is part and parcel of everything that, that Andy named. Leadership development is a critical part of EPIC's mission. And it's a critical part of our EPIC's mission for a lot of reasons, um, but in particular, and I love what UAP Newton says of like, the revolution is always in the hands of the youth. And our young people are incredibly audacious. And there's actually one of our young leaders, Carla Thomas, who invited me and has been like a phenomenal, model an example of what it means to be equipped and have the tools and when a time comes to lead she was ready she was ready and 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 is now like leading the inland empire pi covid response team and is the policy director for the nhpi data policy lab i can't stop bragging enough about carla the, the shining most shining moment she was giving an entire data presentation to elders with with some of our Samoan faith leaders in Samoan and everyone leaving thinking like, oh, that's what we need. Like that is 
that is the future of our communities. Um, that is who we're going to trust. Uh, the other thing that I really think about too, and you know, there's there's so much that we can do right now. Um, but because you know, folks had it effectively, and and what it means actually for me to learn during the pandemic that my most important title is anti vi is because I have five wonderful, my favorite humans on on the planet, nieces and nephews, who you normally see running around during every Zoom webinar. But there's this other component of anti in in the PI community, um, being this this title of respect that very intergenerational and relative in its nature. Uh, and so thinking about how many people I refer to as aunties and uncles um, and that intergenerational component, how critical it's been during the pandemic, especially if we've lost so many elders, um, but what it means to be in this position of, of coming into definitely a junior, a junior varsity auntie. Um, but feeling really protective of our young people of like, how can I be the radical elder that I needed when that, that I was their age? Uh, to offer them the, the generosity of wisdom that so many elders offered me and also the generosity of the patience for learning. Um, how do we retain folks so that they don't burn out and they also don't get, don't feel what can often be the harshness of, of learning in public? Uh, to have a lot of compassion and grace. And I think in so many spaces where I've talked to folks about what it means to be hard on systems and tender with each other and, and having that be a, a critical point. Um, and my initial facial reaction to your question was this, like I, I live my life one, one Google calendar box at a time. And so to think about like, oh, the next pandemic is, you know, too far at this point. Like we we got to get through this one. We got to get through this Omicron variant. Um, but yes, yeah, so want to double down on both funding public health and and funding our young leaders. Well, I want to thank both of our speakers for this for this session. That was really wonderful. Um, and actually, that is a perfect transition to um, Carla Thomas, who will be moderating the next session. Thank you so much, Michelle, and thank you again, Andy and Tobai. I really enjoyed that Q and A, and I'm excited to be, uh, uh, you know, bringing us to nearing the end of this uh, workshop. But um, today, I have the honor and privilege of having a conversation with Miss Julia Choi, um, because this will be a more informal converse, uh, discussion. Um, again, please feel free to answer to answer questions into the Q and A function on Zoom, and I'll do uh, my best to ask, uh, to uh, give those questions to Juliet uh, to have um, answers for as many as possible. Um, so, Ms. Choi is President and Chief Executive Officer of the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum, a national health justice organization. She served in the Obama administration as the former Chief of Staff and the Senior Advisor of two federal agencies, the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and the Office for Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Prior to her political appointments, she led disaster relief operations and strategic partnerships at the American Red Cross. Juliet is the proud daughter of South Korean immigrants. Welcome, Juliet. It's so great to have you. Carla, thanks so much for having me. It's, it's, a, it's a real uh, privilege, and I, I'm so humbled to be able to join you and, uh, and our community audience today. Thank you. Yes, definitely excited to learn more from you. And the uh, topic of, of this uh, last part of our uh, workshop today is the future and the ways forward. And maybe one way that we can begin this is asking you, what do you think are some of the top priorities right now for the Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities? You know, it's uh, and and I want to I want to thank you and uh, the organizers uh, and also the National Academy for uh, creating this space for our community to have this conversation. My understanding is uh, with the National Academies, this is the first time to have a forum, uh, a roundtable on AA and HPI matters. Um, 
And I also want to especially applaud um, and extend special thanks to Dr. Winston Wong, um, along with Kate Anderson, um, and, and all the terrific speakers um, and leaders uh, that have contributed to this two-day forum. You know, uh, I, I know our, this is going to be uh, an informal conversation, and I'm looking forward to, to the dialogue uh, and probably some really tough questions that uh, I'm just going to say at the outset, uh, of course, I'm not going to have the answer or the solution to the questions, but I think it's important to continue to highlight what kind of questions do we want to put in front uh, for our communities, but for all of our stakeholders that we're engaging. Uh, so in terms of the priorities, it's really, really hard to escape where we are as a country right now. Uh, both, uh, not both, but at least uh, from, from three different angles, which is, you know, the devastating impact of COVID-19 on all Americans, but particularly our communities. Uh, and also this more recent wave of anti-Asian violence. Um, I, I think like you and like me and like others, uh, I'm still somewhat surprised and taken aback at uh, how many of our friends and allies are still surprised and sort of, uh, you know, weighted into this model minority myth framework and are surprised to hear that our communities are suffering right now. Um, when we know, uh, you know, the attacks uh, from an anti-racist perspective happens to our communities, you know, at least a decade, de decade and a half, going back to the 1800s. Um, and then on top of that, with COVID and the economic impacts, if we start to peel back the layers and we think about our communities and our families, and our loved ones and folks that we just know from our daily life, we know that the economic impact has been devastating. The educational impact has been devastating. Um, you know, just today, the, uh, there's an entity called the COVID Collaborative. Um, and uh, check out the New York Times as well because there's an article there. Uh, and there's a new report, the Health Forum is, is a part of this collaborative, along with a lot of our uh, allied um, racial equity partners and colleagues. But this new report also highlights a new dimension of COVID that we haven't had a chance to talk about as a country, which is over 170,000 young people have been impacted by COVID in a way where they have lost their primary caretaker or parent. Mm -hmm. um, and that is another very, very real dimension of COVID. And we know from our community conversations that our communities, Asian Americans, and especially Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders have also, our, our young generation have been impacted by this, um, this sort of loss. So those are the kinds of things that I ask us to continue to think about. I think as we start our conversation, another element um, or point of reference that I want to ask us to consider since we're winding down the two-day conversation is that Census 2020 revealed a lot of information, a lot of demographic information that's so, so critical for all communities. Uh, all, and I, I want to underscore all communities, you know, whether it's seniors or LGBTQ or the disability community or rural and then Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. And what I want to highlight, and some of you may have heard me share this before, um, you know, if we go back just 30 years, we had less than 40 counties at the municipality level, less than 40 counties that could claim that, that, that they had an Asian population of 5% or more. That was just 30 years ago. Fast forward to census 2020, we now have about, I think, uh, don't completely quote me here, 175 or 176 counties and municipalities that have an Asian population of 5% or more. 
And so when we take a step back, I'd like to ask us to take a step back. What is what does that mean? I don't think I can fully appreciate all the implications of that. But at a top level, at a high level, what it does connote is, you know what, our community, we are the fastest growing racial ethnic group in the United States. Um, but where we thought we existed, that that no longer holds true. We have now migrated across the country into places we did not exist before. Um, and then if we take this intergenerational approach and analysis to where we are and how we're doing, where have we been and where do we want to go towards? Um, I think these are really big, wonderful questions that we need to ask. Um, and I think later in our conversation, we'll, we'll talk about the role of government. Um, but I do think uh, as we talk about the resiliency and the beauty of the diversity of uh, all of our communities, right, Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, um, it does also really, really ask the larger question of uh, how do we continue to participate and uh, have a role in civic engagement, because that is the daily constant American experience. And how do we do this in allyship? And I want to suggest allyship within the diversity of our communities, but also an allyship with all communities um, and centering Black lives. Um, so let, let me stop there because I, I, I think you've got a lot of questions for me, Carla, and I, I'm looking forward to our dialogue here. Yeah, well, thank you for starting this off with some really important topics from COVID, the impacts that COVID has had on um, education, um, our economy, of course, our AA and NHPI communities. You also bring up how um, Asian Americans are now moving into different regions where they have never been before. And that's it's it's going to be interesting to see how uh, how what policies we might need to uh, cover the uh, these populations in, in new areas. And um, so that leads me into questions about, uh, of course, about policy. What do you think are some current uh, positive policies um, that uh, will benefit Asian Americans and Native Hawaiian uh, Pacific Islander communities? and um, uh, subsequently, how can we improve? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, you know, and, and you highlighted in, in, in part of my background, this is, uh, you know, I, first and foremost, I, I'm the daughter of my parents who immigrated here from the U.S. Uh, and I also feel very honored and privileged to have had the opportunity to serve in a former White House administration. Um, so when we talk about the positive policies now, um, you know, I, ju I just want to be really open and transparent and reflect upon where our communities have been. And this is, you know, I, you know this is a conversation. So I'm going to, you know, converse, right, caucus here today, uh, sitting from Washington, D.C. And I am sort of an inside the beltway kind of a person, but also really, really uh, grounded in, in community um, uh, engagement and partnerships. So. I think talking about the positive efforts now, and there's a lot to celebrate. Um, it starts with the Biden administration when on day one, the president announced and issued his presidential memorandum uh, denouncing racism and xenophobia and the attacks against our communities. Um, there's something to celebrate that we know that, you know, Congress in terms of bipartisan effort um, and the success of passing legislation, their scorecard is, uh, is not faring very well. But earlier this year, thanks to the tremendous leadership of, you know, KPAC Chair Judy Chu, Congresswoman Grace May, and Senator Hirono, uh, you know, amongst us, Sometimes I wonder maybe if we have more women at the table, maybe we'll get things done. Uh, but it was thanks to their leadership, we saw hate crimes legislation get passed overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly in a bipartisan fashion, because at the end of the day, this is the right American thing to do. But I want to celebrate those successes, which are extraordinarily significant and will put us on a different trajectory and dialogue going forward with elected officials, uh, 
with donors, but elected officials, federal, state, local. Um, but let's also declare it and say it out loud, particularly over the last five years, transition from one administration to another. There have been some real devastating impacts, and I'm going to highlight a little bit from a healthcare perspective. We know that over the last five years, um, our immigrant communities, uh, whether it's AA and HPIs and mixed families and mixed status families, but all immigrant communities, um, there was such a gut wrenching, chilling effect with the last administration set of immigration policies, where we know through numbers that our families and loved ones chose not to seek health care out of fear of immigration and deportation. And to try to overcome that kind of a barrier when you know support and services are available to our families and our communities, this is still something we are uh, fighting. This is still something we are countering and addressing. So I'm, I'm always an optimist, um, but I'm also a pragmatist. So, you know, on a, on a daily, weekly basis, I think it's important for us to think about what does it look like and feel like at our community family level, you know, community centric, but also how do we tie that to the national federal dialogue and ensure that the leaders who are here right now uh, work with us. We work with them within our community. And I, when I say within our community, I mean AA and HPIs, uh, but also in an allyship fashion. Um, I think in Congress, if I can just highlight for our audience here, for decades, Congress has worked through um, at least a tri-caucus model, which includes the Black Caucus, the Hispanic Caucus, and the APA Caucus. Um, and I think most of us know that, but it's important to, I think, highlight why coalitions and allyship really, really matters if we're, if we're in this for the long run so that we lift all boats, that we lift, uh, you know, the opportunities to achieving full potential for all of our communities, whatever walk of life we come from. Thank you so much, Jude. You do touch um, a bit about, um, you know, uh, that we do need to work with communities when we uh, come up with policies and engage them. So I think my next question for you would be, how can we continue on that path and create policies that uh, are centered around communities? Sure. Uh, you know, in, in terms of the, the dialogue of how do we ensure, uh, let, me, let me use some DC speak here, if, if, if you'll allow me. <laughs> Uh, you know, stated another way, it's, it's, it's really asking the question and the opportunity for dialogue. What's, what's our policy agenda? Um, and when we think about policy, um, I think it needs to be centered in community and lived experiences. Um, but a policy agenda, you know, it would be wonderful for us collectively with our allies to create the community policy agenda for, for the diversity of our communities. Um, and in order for that to happen, wherever you sit, it really does mean taking the opportunity to step forward and say something. Everybody has a voice. And I understand that how we vocalize our viewpoint or our voice can take lots of different uh, flavors uh, and mechanisms. But I do think, um, and, and I think with a lot of the other speakers over the two-day forum and, and uh, you know, conversations that we're all having in our communities today, it really is about how do we mobilize our voice so that it's community-centered uh, but also, I want to attach, because we do talk about mobilization of community voice, I want to also challenge us, how do we mobilize our voice with impact? Um, and so when we talk about a policy agenda, um, 
you know, it, it does take, I think, a lot more thoughtful, heartful, sometimes tough conversations to figure out how do we coalesce? How do we honor differences? Things where maybe there's not full consensus, um, but creating an agenda we can all work around, put our voices behind, invest in that agenda so that we can measure real policy impact. Um, sometimes I do worry, um, and I'm being very honest here, sometimes I do worry that the dialogue is so incredibly rich, but then how do we harness this so that we do have that policy impact and that, that policy world is a whole nother beast. Um, and I know it's not always friendly to communities that look like us or immigrant communities and new Americans, but that's both our opportunity and challenge to tackle going forward. Um, that is a great um, answer to that question. It is definitely a little bit foreign to our communities, how we become more civically engaged, but nonetheless a, a path and solution that we have to step into um, here in the diaspora in, in the United States. Um, I, I know that you did touch on COVID-19. I want to go back to that because, you know, that's still an ongoing problem affecting our AA and NHPI community so harshly. And um, there have been many, um, you know, impacts on the communities, like you mentioned, um, whether that's, uh, you know, in the, within our households, with, uh, with school for our youth, uh, the socioeconomic impacts and so forth. Um, and as other speakers um, have described earlier, uh, there's just been a lot of, uh, it's revealed that there's been a lot of problems um, in how effective the public health response has been for AA and NHPI communities. So what do you think will be the enduring uh, features of a community and public health approach to ensuring equity in AA and NHPI health? Yeah, um, I, uh, that's a wonderful question. And I think it's a question that we need to continue to keep in front of us. Um, and hopefully we'll all come back together again, say next year mm -hmm. and bring some of these questions back up and see if we've made some progress, but also, you know, uh, discover some of our learned lessons or learning lessons. Um, and also think about, talk about what we try to do collectively, perhaps that we're successful and sometimes that we're uh, not as successful. Um, so an enduring uh, approach, if you will, I'm gonna sort of tug on my former disaster experience as well, mm -hmm. because COVID itself, it is a pandemic. Um, and I think a lot of our audience can appreciate this, you know, the national federal government has always had what we call a playbook uh, when there's a national disaster, including pandemics. Um, and so, you know, a couple questions. Number one, the solution on an enduring framework for success, it's, it's I can state it simply, but I know it's hard to implement and execute. People who look like us and have these kinds of lived experiences, we need to be at the table. We need to be at all of the tables, locally, statewide, federally, um, you know, at those decision-making tables. Um, we do not have enough of uh, people that look like us at those critical decision-making tables. Um, if we're not there, our issues, our strengths will not be appreciated, discussed, absorbed, um, as well as, uh, but for, uh, as well as if we were at those tables. Um, I think also, particularly from the public health lens, um, and I think maybe some of the previous conversations covered this, we also need to think about what are some of the touch points within the public health system where we can make immediate changes and impacts as well as make some systemic changes to forecast a change trajectory. 
And some of those elements include really uh, intentional magnitudinal investments in our communities. So that when we talk about this notion of public health workers, we need to grow the pipeline and have our communities be part of that pipeline. When we talk about community organizations who serve as navigators, these are frontline folks, pandemic or not. Um, and what I also worry about and know that when so much decision-making happens at the local government and at the state government level, um, I'm worried that those decision-making officials, elected officials, do not know our communities well enough. And when I tie that into the demographic I highlighted about Census 2020 at the top of the conversation, and I say that there are at least 175 counties now that have an Asian population of 5% or more. Um, you know, can we geo map? Can elected officials geo map? Is there adequate representation, both from a community level and a decision making level, to include our communities? If there were a clarion call, the one thing I would ask every uh, industry, uh, government agency, uh, foundation, um, funder to think about is, do you have a community advisory council, an established advisory council that includes AA and HPIs? If you don't, this is not a new concept. Go ahead and get that started, and then we can have another dialogue next year, because it's that constancy of dialogue and representation that's really going to make the institutional systemic change, right? Yeah, I definitely love that answer. And I have noticed through um, in this pandemic that there is definitely a disparity between who is making the decisions um, for the communities that they're serving. There's just such a, a big population difference. And I know that during this time uh, or during the onset of the pandemic, um, while Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders were, you know, being very hard hit by COVID-19, we didn't have any representation in public health. Um, in many of our areas where, you know, there are lots of um, NHPI families and we, a lot of community organizers, at least uh, for my hometown locally, we had to reach out to public health and they had never, ever been in touch with NHPI, CBO, community-based organizations. It was the first time, you know, and we kind of had to give them a rundown of, you know, who NHPIs are, what our health issues are, why we are deserving of health equity. And it's, um, it, it, you know, it was of course uh, just uh, a little down that we had, that this was the first interaction between public health and NHPIs, given that there are so many health disparities that have existed long before COVID-19, but, you know, maybe that's, uh, you know, a silver lining in this pandemic um, that, it, you know, we are now able to bridge communities closer to these decision makers. Um, so thank you so much for that answer. Um, I think you also bring up a bit, or this, uh, you know, kind of ties into uh, bridging communities and stakeholders and, uh, you know, working in unity and solidarity. So how can we continue to work in solidarity and allyship uh, with not only you know, stakeholders, but other communities, maybe outside of AA and NHPI communities um, to address um, uh, you know, issues that affect all of us like um, uh, hate and, and racism? Yeah, no, thank you for that. And, and Carla, like, I, I also really appreciate you know, your reflections. Uh, if we were all here in a room together, you know, I, I would be applauding you. You're, uh, I, I really appreciate you being such um, a gracious and thoughtful moderator here for our conversation. You know, I, as, as I start to talk about how, how, how do we go forward, how do we go about allyship, I, I do want to underscore just a little bit more what you highlighted sure. in terms of the devastating impact of COVID particularly for the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities. Um, because I, I want to acknowledge, you know, even at the health forum, but I, again, across the country, um, you know, it, it raises the question, you know, how do we have our own community conversations? Because 
even as public health officials may not have uh, known about the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander communities, and certainly the numbers are growing, right? Since this 2020 revealed that Asian American population um, in some parts has increased by over 20, 25%, and other places, uh, especially on the continent for Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, some, some places in some states, the population has grown by uh, close to 30%. Um, so I, I think we need to keep that in front of us going forward. I do hearken back to, again, this is part of my disaster experience is that, you know, uh, for those of us that were there for Hurricane Katrina, that was the time when the rest of the country just didn't even know that the Asian American community or the Southeast Asian American community even existed in the Gulf Coast. Um. When at the time, like if you dug into the local community and the economy, the fishing ports, most of the fishing business uh, was conducted, you know, like on the backs of the Vietnamese and Cambodian communities. Um, so I think there will sadly continue to be these chapters where for the rest of us, as we have these dialogues, we can and must continue to be that advocate for our communities and remain in a learning mode. I mean, I will speak for myself. You know, I, I decided to change this notion. You get with colleagues and you talk about learned lessons, past tense. And I really think it's present tense, learning lessons for all of us. There's so much to learn. Uh, and then also, I'd be remiss if I didn't also talk about, you know, we celebrated recently the anniversary of 9-11. Um, and we are seeing the impacts uh, what the refugee community is experiencing. Um, and this impacts our communities as well. So the Southeast Asian community, the Muslim American community, the Sikh community. Um, so when we're talking about, you know, the gaps and the opportunities, I would ask us to, you know, hold all of our communities together. Now, shifting to allyship, you know, of course, this is, uh, I think, uh, through, through love and commitment and compassion for one another. Um, I also think it takes real intentionality um, because talking about, uh, I think my challenge, positive challenge, I would ask all of us is, how do we create a space and come from a place of sufficiency and abundance um, and grow allyship um, because particularly with COVID and we're talking about thousands, thousands of lost lives. Um, I do reflect professionally and personally that, you know, it, it gets very, very hard. It does feel like we're on the defensive um, and for me, you know, I ask my friends and my colleagues and my mentors, like, help me, hold me up to think about going about these conversations of allyship from a place of abundance, um, but without sugarcoating some of the real stark, difficult uh, uh, conversations. Um, but I think allyship, it, it needs to be a framework of intentionality. It does mean taking risk. I think uh, being transparent with a sense of integrity and care, um, you know, for the health forum, uh, I want to say some of our learning lessons, uh, we've been very, very fortunate to be part of a racial equity uh, collaborative called the Anchors um, and our colleagues, uh, and it's, it's an effort supported by Kellogg Foundation, and this includes our partners like the NAACP and Unidos U.S. and National Congress of American Indians um, and National Urban League and uh, Faith in Action um, and, and so many more. Um, but earlier this year, for example, we, we thought, you know, we need to have a shared conversation about Juneteenth and this notion of reparations. Uh, and is there a way for our communities to help facilitate and take a, I don't, leadership is not the correct, quite the right word, but how can we be intentional and step forward together to have those kinds of conversations? So we were really, really fortunate to bring together, you know, some leaders across our respective communities. 
together with uh, the award-winning film director, John Osaki, his film Reparations, um, which also highlights some of the experiences, but also the leadership voice from so many of uh, our, our living legends um, who have worked on, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Japanese internment uh, history and reparations from that experience. Uh, but also, you know, we followed it up together with John Osaki just last month on a conversation about, you know, not your model minority. Um, and also when we're able to, and wanting to have a conversation like this um, and in the face of anti-Asian violence, I have to say to have leaders from the black community and the Latino community, like just step out just formally and informally just to say, you know, how are you doing? This is so painful and we want to hold you up. Uh, that's the kind of stuff that brings you to tears. Um, but from a place of, you, you know, we're, we're actually being seen and heard and held. Um, so I, I think, you know, I don't, I don't have a magic solution to that. But I think it's an opportunity and a challenge for us collectively of there's always so much to do, but how do we be intentional uh, with allyship, take one step forward, and then the next time, hopefully we can take a couple more steps forward and a little bit more quickly, uh, and hopefully with a little more uh, comfort uh, and sense of true friendship um, and allyship. Yeah, beautifully said, Julia. Thank you so much. I, I really love that, um, you know, idea of framing uh, allyship around um, abundance rather than scarcity and uh, finding commonalities that bring us together and, um, you know, really centering also intentionality um, because that's so important and for also uplifting um, the Black community um, in your answer because they have been uh, very vocal about speaking out against anti-Asian um, hate and that's something that we should definitely um, uh, celebrate and um, something that, you know, brings uh, communities of color together. Um, I also see that there's um, a question um, from the audience um, that asks them, what's the best way to follow up with questions about outreach to Asian American communities? And I'm, uh, maybe that has to do with uh, engaging communities and policies, um, but what, what, what do you think is the best way to uh, engage in outreach to Asian American communities? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And I, now that you mentioned, I'm trying to look at the chat box here and try to talk and read at the same time. So I think it's uh, one of our colleagues from uh, Office of Minority Health, um, Health Equity, that's great. Um, you know, finding ways to follow, you know, the, the health forum, I think anybody who's participating in this roundtable is a resource. Um, and if, if we at the health forum can be a resource to, you know, connect you with others or share just an informal dialogue, you can reach us at community engagement at apiahf.org. Um, again, it's community engagement at apiahf.org. Uh, but, you know, again, that first measure is, you know, the work that you do, whatever position you have, um, do, you, do you have a circle? Do you have a mechanism? Do you have an opportunity to invite the AA and HPI voice? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and then take it up a, a level. It's, uh, I, I'm actually talking about beyond a one time only, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so everyone has to start somewhere. But maybe you're working on a project. Maybe your colleague is a, is a director of a team or your colleague is a director of a division. Um, yeah, just ask the question, do you, do you have a community advisory group? Do you have a mechanism like a community advisory group so that you can invite folks in um, into your dialogue and, and start from there? Yeah, that's a, um, definitely a great response. And I think that ties in also with uh, what you mentioned earlier about having community advisory councils um, being so core in engaging um, AA and NHPI communities in research and academics and policy and so forth. So um, there are definitely um, uh, structures that we can create uh, 
to sustain community engagement. And um, yeah, Julia, thank you so much uh, for that. Um, I do want to ask if you have um, any specific recommendations, maybe um, touching on any of these topics that we've talked about, um, just uh, going back to what our overall uh, uh, you know, theme is for this segment, which is the future and the ways forward. What are some uh, recommendations you would make for uh, AA and NHPI communities in, in moving forward, whether that's in policy and reaching health equity um, in public health um, and yeah, anything that comes to mind? Sure. And this is, uh, I, I know this conversation could be so much longer and uh, especially like looking at the uh, questions and comments that are being posted. I think we have a lot of experts in the audience. So I'm going to try to think about like who's in our audience, right? Our community audience today. Um, I think a few things. Um, civic engagement is so important. I know that sometimes when we have these kinds of roundtables, you know, we maybe more than half the time we come at it from like a national federal place, um, you know, and, 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 and that's, that's, that's where I come from as well. Um, but I do want to underscore how important civic engagement is. Um, so, you know, uh, again, being the daughter of immigrants, and I think many, uh, a lot of us, um, if you have loved ones who are not registered to vote, make sure they, they get registered to vote. Um, and if you, you, you have a voice, um, you know, there's so many critical conversations that are happening at the school board level. So, you know, like the, the parent teacher, uh, association, um, your city council, there are so many different volunteer commissions where you can join. Um, so get involved. If, if it's just one thing, get involved from a civic engagement standpoint, um, invite in new and uh, unusual partners to your table. Um, and I'm saying that because I apply that to, to my organization and my team. And so, for example, this year, our, our, some of our new strategic partnerships have included, for example, the Korematsu Institute, who you know, does civil rights curriculum and education across schools in the US. And they have a network of teachers in schools I thought, wow, the power of bringing us together extends our reach. Um, I also thought about, you know, faith matters to a lot of communities and families. And so we we're now working with the Zuchi Buddhist Foundation um, because they do a lot of health care and community coalition building. Um, and as well as I'm, I'm one of those recovering attorneys in Washington, D.C., um, but working with the National APA Bar Association, earlier this year, we were able to jointly create some critical toolkits um, to counter and define what, what is a hate crime, what's a hate incidence, what is bullying, why does it matter whether we report an incident or not. Um, and then also we wanted to create a know your rights and know your facts for COVID vaccinations. And doing that together with um, a national organization of lawyers and judges um, just added different attention and energy to our efforts. And also, you know, within a couple of weeks, we were able to translate those toolkits into over 25 Asian, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander languages. Uh, and then you know, I, I do want to highlight, um, I was, excuse me, you probably saw me like looking down a couple of times here or there. Um, while we were meeting and talking today, just at 2.30, the White House announced um, the new two co-chairs for the White House initiative on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. So it's Secretary Becerra of HHS and Ambas uh, Ambassador Tai. Um, the, the PTO representative. Um, so when we think about the future um, with Crystal Kai, who is Native Hawaiian, she's the high, one of the highest ranking Native Hawaiians in the Biden-Harris administration. She is the executive director of the White House Initiative. Uh, this gives me and us, I think, a lot of hope um, and energy uh, that we do have avenues to make sure our voices are heard 
Um, but we need to make sure this happens not just from Washington, D.C., but at uh, community local levels. Um, the very last thing I want to say and ask for is uh, I hope this is year one of this roundtable hosted by the National Academies. Uh, I applaud the National Academies uh, for hosting this. We all have to start somewhere. Um, and candidly, I think some of us were also surprised that this is the first time there's been an intentional conversation focused on our communities. So again, again very, very much applaud that. Appreciating we have a lot of researchers in the audience. I also do hope in quick fashion, sometime over the next months, in partnership with the White House, in partnership with industry, we will be able to create some kind of a convening to actually figure out a data and a research agenda for our communities. Um, COVID has laid bare, um, especially COVID, but I always do say disaster or not, if we're not counted, if we don't have the numbers, then by definition, our voices will not be heard. We will not be seen. People will say, I didn't know you existed in this community. So I am really eager and hungry for some kind of research consortium to come about together. I'm very, very happy for the health forum to try to like contribute to that offer, uh, to that opportunity. But I know in our audience, we have a lot of really powerful, influential decision makers who come from all walks of academia and industry and government. So uh, before we leave, I think that's the challenge I want to share back with our community audience. That was a wonderful way to wrap up this conversation, conversation Julia. Thank you so much. I really um, do also want to highlight that there's so many firsts in this era from having the first Native Hawaiian or any NHPI at the White House Initiative initiative on AA and NHPIs, and also this being, like you said, a historic uh, roundtable for uh, the National Academies as being uh, the first AA and NHPI workshop. Uh, we thank you so much for these specific recommendations and hope that our audience will take all of these um, to reflect and hopefully use in practice and in reality with the communities that they work with. Um, again, thank you so much, Juliet, for your wisdom and your time that you've spent with us today. Um, with that, I will um, pass this to Dr. Winston Wong. Uh, thank you, Carla. What a tremendous uh, dialogue that you had with uh, Ms. Choi at the forum. And uh, I don't think you noted uh, Juliet uh, explicitly, but I believe it's apiahf.org that you should certainly avail yourself of not only all the um, resources that, that's available at that website, but also the leadership perspective that certainly um, Ms. Choi and her staff have um, really led. Um, it gives me a lot of uh, confidence and, and optimism with regards to where our leadership is going. And also uh, reflecting on today, how illuminating we've had in terms of not just content, but I think where people come from and uh, the solidness in which we make relationships around what we do today relative to what our origins are and our ancestry and our love for our kapuna, our elders and the generations before us. Um, we do hope that this will not be the last of uh, forums that the National Academy will sponsor around Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander populations. But to that end, um, to the audience, I want to ask that if you felt the last two days, the last day was particularly helpful, informative, just please send a note uh, to us um, at the round table. Um, at the um, Academy of Medicine's website, or if you want to send that directly to me, I invite you to do that. Uh, I have a relatively easy email address. It's WF, like Frank, Wong, MD, at AOL.com. Now you're saying AOL. Uh, a lot of people say, wow, I haven't seen that. i like to point out to you that I'm not a dinosaur. I'm an early adopter. So WF, Wong, MD, at AOL.com. <laughs> 
Uh, I want to thank again all our uh, attendees, you and the audience, uh, the planning committee, and uh, the staff at the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, certainly Rose and Kat and Chris, uh, Christy. Uh, the proceedings for this workshop and Tuesdays will be forthcoming and presentations and other meeting materials are available at our roundtable website, uh, which um, will be, um, you'll find at the National Academies of, uh, of Medicine um, website. So with that, I, I want to uh, sign off and uh, wish everybody a good day as well as a healthy and safe holiday season. And there's the website. Thank you very much.